Good morning, and I'm glad that I have the opportunity this morning to be able to share with you God's word that he really put on my heart. Um, Pastor Martin did uh, give me an idea. I did ask him if there was anything he wanted me to uh, speak about this morning, and he said it was up to me, but he did say that I could um, sort of tackle the the subject of Saul's conversion, and that's in the book of Acts. So I went into there, I, I did some, uh, some research, and I learned a lot. <laughs> it's amazing how you can be in the Word of God for a number of years, and every time you go back into the same scripture, the same story, you just it's like God just reveals new things, right? It's just, it's awesome. So, um, Speaking of new things, um, here's something that might shock you. Even though it's hard in this day and age to get shocked by anything, but uh, are you ready? Okay. So Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the entire world. Out of any religion, and there's a lot of persecuted religions, but Christianity is actually up there as the number one. So there's a group called Open Doors, and they are basically a missional group that help um, persecuted churches around the world. And they put out a study, each year they put out uh, statistics, but they put out a study in 2021, so not that long ago, and the numbers are pretty much the same today, that there's over 360 million Christians living in our world who are living in highly persecuted countries, countries where persecution is very serious. So just to put that into context, there are 332 million people living in the United States of America. If you bring in 30 million more, which is almost the whole population of Canada, that's how many Christians are being persecuted in our world right now, or facing persecution. So there were, in 2021, there were 500, sorry, 5,600 Christians that were murdered for their faith. There were 6,000 Christians that were detained or imprisoned for their faith, and there was another 4,000 that were kidnapped. More than 5,000 churches and other religious facilities were destroyed. And the data that's collected shows that there's actually 11 nations in the world that are guilty of severe extreme persecution. So what that means is that in in some countries, Christian converts, um, they face very severe consequences if their new faith is discovered to the point where they either have to flee the country or be killed. So, the premise of the Christian faith hinges on Jesus Christ being the Son of God, being crucified for, our sin, for the forgiveness of our sins, and being resurrected on the third day. So the gospel message rests on this idea that we have hope for our eternal souls because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he is who he says he is. And the entirety of the New and Old Testament chronicles this prophetic arrival of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Jesus as the Messiah, um, both his atoning work um, on the cross and this, um, basically this redemption run that he's been on ever since, redeeming souls, redeeming souls that we're in right now, and then eventually there'll be his second coming, which is yet to come. So... The revolution, revolutionary nature of Christianity is that it's counterculture, cu- countercultural, and it's very unique in that it's um, based on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, a personal relationship with the living God. Okay, I don't know a lot too much about a lot of other religions, but I think that that's pretty unique to the Christian faith. So, by believing that God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day and confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that is how we are saved. And yet, (laughs) churches around the world are as different from each other as they are from the, as the East is from the West on a lot of other things, right? So um, there's actually a church in Kansas 
And um, <clears throat> so there's a church in Kansas that seemingly totally missed the mark. So they, um, they show up places, they protest, they, sent, they show up with messages not of hope, but of hate. And they craft these signs that says God hates, and then you can fill in the blank with whatever group of people that they're protesting at the time. And they claim that God hates certain groups of people, they claim that God hates certain Christian denominations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so it's called, the church is called Westboro Baptist, and it's an unaffiliated Baptist church. And it just, it's very alarming to me to think that there are people who are regularly attending and participating in a church that claims to be Christian that are totally, completely going against the great commandments and the great commission, right? So we know that God is love, right? And the great command, Jesus said, um, he basically summed up the entire law and the demands of the prophets when he gave the commandments to his disciples saying, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your, thank you, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, number one. And number two, second great commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said this, this the top commandments for us to follow, Okay. Now, something happened in the day that Jesus was walking the earth, both healing and um, preaching, teaching, um, over 2,000 years ago. Most of the religious leaders at the time, uh, they were very, very powerful, highly influ they were the most influential leaders in all of Israel, the religious, the religious um, leaders, all right? And they were hungry, okay? They were hungry for power, they were hungry for money, and they were hungry for status. So this hunger made them lose sight of God. And because they were so influential um, to the nation, their spiritual blindness was spreading to other people. It was just spreading through the nation. Now, Jesus was a Jew, right? He was Jewish. He, um, he was called rabbi, teacher, rabbi. And he um, actually... Not only did he 100% endorse um, the law of Moses, he actually came to fulfill the law, and he did. So uh, just to give you that idea so that you can kind of keep that in, in your mind, um, now, that, now that Jesus came, all right, he fulfilled the law, the old law of Moses has passed away. We're no longer living under the law of Moses because we have the new law of Christ. It's a new covenant. All right. Um, but at the time, Jesus was calling out the hypocrisy of all these religious leaders. So I just want you to listen to this. This is actually Jesus speaking right here. Um, and this is in Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 15. So he said, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. For you cross land and sea to make one convert, to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell that you yourselves are. <laughs> then he goes on to call them blind fools and blind guides. So I want you to hold on to that word convert for a minute. We're going to come back. That word that Jesus used, we're going to come back to that. Most churches in North America have condemned Westboro Baptist, including the two largest Baptist organizations in the whole world. Now, Westboro Baptist may only be a church of 70 people, most of whom are related to the founding pastor, but when the media highlights these protests and it's on the news, it really can have a detrimental effect, it can really mislead viewers into having a wrongful thought or a wrong way of thinking about what Christianity is all about. Wrong thinking, off the mark. I want you to think for a minute if you have ever had a situation where you thought you were doing the right thing only to later realize that you were wrong. Okay, it's part of the human condition, so you got to say yes. <laughs> I know y'all have. <laughs> I know I have, and more than once. But um, sometimes we might think that we're actually even doing the right thing 
in God's eyes, but we're actually fighting against God. We're actually resisting his will. And we're going to talk about a man named Saul today who had this experience. So maybe we can learn something from, from him. So Saul was a Jewish man. He was actually a Pharisee, very well learned, learned man. He walked the earth at the same time that Jesus did when Jesus walked the earth as both man and God. And Saul witnessed the killing of Stephen, the first murdered Christian, um, when Stephen was stoned for his faith. And Saul agreed with it. In fact, he walked away from that. And his mission at that point was, it was like confirmed, like his mission was to become an enemy of the followers of Jesus Christ. So at the very same time that he was doing that, what was happening was Jesus had already just been uh, crucified for the forgiveness of our sins, resurrected on the third day, walked around for 40 days, right, with revealed himself to over 300 people, and then he ascended to heaven. So the early church was on fire. The the day of Pentecost had come. The Holy Spirit fire had rained down on over 3,000 believers. People, the message of the good news was being spread um, like wildfire, actually, and people were coming to Christ, coming to, to saving knowledge in Jesus Christ. It was a very, very exciting time, but at the same time that that was happening, Saul, like God was breathing new life into all these people, and Saul was breathing death out with every breath. So we're going to go into reading Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 22, to give you an idea. So, okay. So, meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. I'm going to read that again. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. Eager. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way that he found there. The way was um, the early church. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So the, the early church followers, they were called the way. So here we have Saul, and he is actually trying to get these religious leaders in another, very far away from Jerusalem, by the way, Damascus was really far from there, and he was trying to get those religious leaders of the synagogues to be accomplices to him in this, I mean, I would call it a crime, maybe back then it wasn't considered a crime, but if you look at the Ten Commandments that Saul was supposed to follow, one says, thou shalt not kill, So to me, that's kind of like, okay, what's he thinking here? Um, He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Okay, this is his mission. Go and hunt down the Christians, bring them back, imprison them, have them killed. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul? Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. So it wasn't a hallucination. This was very real. The other men that were with Saul heard the voice of Jesus. But because the message wasn't directed to them, it was specifically for Saul. This is, this is why maybe um, they didn't fully hear or understand the message. But um, Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he saw, sorry, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and didn't eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. (laughs) 
But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things that this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and he's authorized by the leading priest to arrest anyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went, and he found Saul. He laid his hands on him, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up, he was baptized, and afterwards he ate some food and he regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, okay, wait a minute. (laughs) How many days are we talking about here? How many days just went by between... Three. Good rows. Yes, it's three. Three days. He was on a mission to hunt down and arrest these Christians, these believers, with zeal. And three days later, he's standing in the very same synagogues that he had written to, to, you know, partner with him to have the, to have the believers um, arrested. So he's in the synagogues, and he's saying, he is indeed the Son of God. Like this is complete, total 180, complete transformation that happens in just three days. How did this happen? How did this happen? Well, God interrupted Saul's plans with his own plan. And this was a plan that involved Saul becoming the Apostle Paul, Saul and Paul means the same thing. Paul is just like the Greek name for Saul, and later on he did go and share the message in the Greek world. So, um, but he wrote uh, a a large portion of the New Testament. So we're going to come back to this word now, convert, and what it means. Okay, so to convert means to bring over from one belief to another, very simply. Um, to change or adapt the form of something or someone, and to transform. So Jesus transformed Saul's thinking. He corrected his vision, and he rechanneled his passion so that he was now fighting for what was true and what was right, using the weapons of peace to share a message of hope. He became a servant to the one that he was out to kill, while the followers, he was persecuting Jesus, right, by persecuting um, the believers in Christ. And his whole mindset was flipped, all right? And it was flipped from this idea that um, he's going out to kill them to realizing that to die is gain. He says that later on, that, you know, to die to your old self, which is what happens when we come to Christ, when we come to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ, we die to our old selves, all right? That's what baptism represents, and we have new life in Christ. So this is what Saul came to realize in three days, all right? True conversion comes from a personal encounter with Jesus Christ that leads to new life in relationship with Jesus. So why was Saul blinded? Why did he go blind for three days? Any ideas? Why did Jesus basically blind him? (laughs) So he could have some time to think. Go in your corner and think. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was basically to humble him. You know, he had pride. And so Jesus needed to assert his authority and his power so that Saul could be humbled before him and so that he could recognize his absolute dependence on Jesus. He absolutely needed Jesus to heal him because who healed him? It was Jesus, right? And Jesus worked through this incredible way of um, orchestrating these events that could only be seen as divine, sending Ananias and then having Saul here. This is what 
God said to me, and this is what you're doing, and now you're healed, and the scales fell from his eyes, and he experienced true miraculous healing. Um, so, yeah, so Jesus, um, or sorry, Saul needed to see Jesus' power and authority also to be successful in the ministry that God had called him to, right? And just like God taking the Israelites, God took the Israelites through the wilderness to teach them dependence on him, right? They needed to depend on him, and, and then he brought them to the promised land, Right? It was this journey to the promised land. But he, first they had to spend 40 years in the wilderness, like learning to actually trust God and depend on him. And then God led them right into, um, into the good place that he'd prepared for them. So Jesus had to stop Saul in his tracks, overwhelm him with his power, blind him so that he would realize that he is powerless in his own strength without Jesus. Now, the secular world, the non-Christian world, has taken this word conversion, and they sort of made it into, or they see it as a negative word, a negative thing. As if somehow individuals with uh, maybe alternative agendas, not so on the up and up, are trying to corrupt the minds of non-churchgoers or new churchgoers. And this, unfortunately, happens sometimes went in the wrong hands, as we see with Westboro Baptist, okay? Um, because there can be a twisted take on Christianity with this wrong thinking that can come out. But to truly, truly change, truly transform, truly go from one belief to another, okay? Um, I would argue that that can't be forced on anybody, I would argue that, especially what we see with Saul, it actually only happens if you have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit does a work, right? We have to hear the gospel message, yes, but the Holy Spirit has a part to play in this as, as well as our own choice. So, and especially when we, what we see with Saul is it wasn't even a person, it wasn't even a group of people that convinced him it was Jesus Christ himself, the living God, who revealed himself to him, confronted him, right? And, and then healed him. Well, he orchestrated the events um, that he could see were only, could only be divine, divinely done. So that applies for us too, though. And that applies for anybody. Um, I don't think anybody can talk anybody into truly believing for a lifetime in Jesus Christ. It has to be Jesus revealing, Jesus convincing, Jesus showing himself to us. So, all right, so this idea of, of wrong thinking and God, God actually writing our thinking, God, God needing to change our wrong thinking into true thinking and right thinking. Um, how, we, how can we apply this in our life? Well, the Bible helps us. Um, so God is going to be the one to right our thinking, our wrong thinking. So he does that when we surrender to him. And the Bible says that the way to test our thinking is to, first of all, ask ourselves, are we in Christ? Do we have the Holy Spirit? We need to do that check. It says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. So in Lamentations, the um, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40, it says, let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. So if we're getting off in our thinking, if we're going into a wrong way of thinking, then we, you know, we can ask, we can examine our ways, and, and then we can return to the Lord. It's not too late. This is the way to test our spiritual condition, too. Now, how do we really do that, then? How do we test our thinking? Again, it goes back to God. We need to pray, and we need to ask God. We need to ask him to test our thinking. So the word says, search me, God. So it's asking God to search us. Search me. In prayer, we're saying, search me, God. 
and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, so maybe wrong thinking, and lead me in the way of everlasting. And that's Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24. Now, we have the benefit of the Holy Spirit. Those of us who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, and we do believe in him, um, then we do have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. But we do have an enemy. And the enemy is out to deceive us. The enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. So we need to suit up with the armor of God. Right? We need to check and see, do we ha- are we exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit? Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Um, and because we're human, we're susceptible to sin. But just like Saul, we have the forgiveness of our sins available to us because of what Jesus did. Okay, So anyone can be transformed from darkness into light at any point in their human existence. Anyone can be transformed from darkness into light. If Saul could, anyone could. An enemy of the faith to the extreme that he was going out and hunting down Christians and having them killed and incarcerated. And yet God chose him to be the instrument to go out and preach and write, like, what was it, like a third of the New Testament or something? So... um, Yeah, so you might not have, um, oh, and God chooses also, by the way, so God chooses. So when I see that anyone can be transformed, um, Romans 9.15 tells us, God says, I will show mercy to anyone I choose. Okay, it's not who we choose, it's who God chooses. He chooses who he's going to um, transform. So it is through hearing the gospel message right? We, hear, we have to hear the word of God or read it, and then the work of the Holy Spirit comes into play to open that door. And you don't actually need to wait, though, for a bright light from heaven to come down on you like what happened with Saul, because God's personal encounter with us is so personal that it's going to happen in an individual way, in a unique way for each, each person. It's not going to look the same for everybody, okay? So um, it's through God's word, though, first and foremost, that, that um, God will reveal his will to you. And because Jesus is the word. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that's been made, and in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Anybody can be transformed from darkness into light. True conversion comes from a personal encounter with Jesus. And that conversion can happen at any time. Okay? It can happen when you are reading the Bible. It can happen when you're at a worship service. It can happen when you're out on the lake. It can happen when you're down on your knees on the bathroom floor. It can happen when you're walking into the most destructive path you've ever walked in. It can happen at any time. Because God is all-powerful, and his plans supersede our plans, and he will interrupt our plans. Now, how do we test our thinking and actions? Let's just review this for a minute. I just want to break it down for you really simply. Number one, prayer. Pray to God. Ask him to show you if your thinking is off. Okay? Go into, number two, go into the word of God to test that out too. And you can pray and read the Bible at the same time. You can pray before you go in and you can just ask God to reveal to you. You know, you can look in the scriptures and see. I just had this this week. There was something I was believing for many years just because I heard other Christians talk about it. But I never really did my own research on it into what, what does scripture say about it. And it was amazing that within two hours, <laughs> something that I was pretty sure about was flipped on its head, and I realized, no, nope, that was wrong thinking. This is what the truth is, right? This is where we find our truth. And now we think differently about it. I'm still going to do more research on it, but <laughs> I do think differently about it. Now I realize that I was getting my um, information from other people, but I wasn't checking it in the word of God. And I didn't even really pray and ask God to show me until this past weekend. Um, the, number th- the third thing we can do to check our thinking is to check with other 
wise, mature Christians. People who doesn't mean that they are high up there in numbers, in age necessarily. It just means that they have um, been walking with God for long enough and truly, um, you know, they apply the spiritual disciplines in their life. Um, you know, they, they walk by the Spirit. Check with them because they can pray for you. Um, they can maybe direct you to certain scripture passages to help correct your thinking on that or show you if you are thinking correctly um, or acting, you know, the way that is God's will for you. All right. Now, as a church, we can also hold each other accountable. Actually, we have to. We're supposed to. <laughs> We're supposed to hold each other accountable to right thinking as a church, right? I don't think any church wants to end up like that church in Kansas. So, um, and I know that's an extreme case, but... Like I said, the enemy's sneaky, he's deceptive, he wants to, what does he want to do? He just, he doesn't want us to believe in God, he doesn't want us to have fellowship, he wants to tear down and divide the church, he wants to tear down and divide families, he wants to tear down and divide our own personal um, identity in Christ. So we need to be vigilant and we need to hold each other accountable as a church. So some ways that churches can do this, that we can do this, um, we can conduct Bible studies, we can... Um, run certain uh, ministries like prayer ministry. Um, we can mentor and disciple each other. And, you know, it, it just, there's different ways to, to hold each other accountable as, as um, members of the church, as the body of Christ. So I just want you to um, walk away today, this morning, knowing full well that, um, you know, you don't have to be afraid of wrong thinking because God will show you what's right if you seek his will, all right? And we have the best thing in the world to help us with that. And we are very privileged to have that. Um, like we just talked, I just mentioned the 360 million Christians worldwide who are persecuted. Um, many of them don't have access to Bibles. Um, many of them, if they are found to have Bibles, um, could be thrown into prison for that. So I think we take it for granted a lot of the time that we do have access to the Word of God, just like at our fingertips at any Christian bookstore, any church, right? But I think we have like an op like sort of a you know, as Christians, we're supposed to bear each other's burdens, and I think we have an obligation to really, really um, value and understand that we have something that Christians around the world would die for. You know, it's pretty big. So anyway, let's just uh, pray and um, bring this before God. Heavenly Father, um, we just lift up to you uh, your word, Lord. We lift up to you your truth, and um, I just lift up all these um, beautiful souls here today. Lord, um, we just thank you so much that you've given us this free gift through Jesus Christ, this free gift through your Son, that we have complete forgiveness for every sin um, we've ever done, for every sin, sinful thought we've ever had. Um, and, you know, because of, because of you, we have new life. We have new life in Christ, and, um, and we have this beautiful relationship with you. Our souls will live on eternally with you, Lord, and that is the best gift we could ever receive. Lord, I pray that you help us, Lord, if we are off in our thinking about anything. Lord, um, that you will correct our thinking, that you will help us to seek your will and your truth, and, uh, and that you will just help us to get back on that um, straight path, Lord, that you've made for us. Um, thank you that you've chosen us to be part of your family, Lord. Help us to be good family members to each other, hold each other accountable, speak the truth in love, and continue to um, meet together and fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>